the League of Extraordinary Stock Pickers. The League of Extraordinary Stock Pickers. Yep, something that had never existed before and may never exist again. It was a one year test. Uh, I think it was a successful test, so we may well do this again. We have no immediate plans right now. But what am I talking about? Well, what I'm talking about is the subject of the first half of this week's podcast. Specifically, one year ago, in our Motley Fool Rule Breaker service, we invited some of our most engaged members, these are just paying customers, to pick stocks along with us five a month each of the last 12 months. Picked from existing Rule Breakers picks in the same way that we do for our Best Buys Now features. So many of you are Stock Advisor members or Rule Breaker members. You'll know that once a month we come out with lists of our Best Buys Now. Those are looking at existing companies that we've already recommended and saying we like these companies this month, these five for the next three plus years. We do come out with new picks every month in these services, but the purpose of Best Buys now is to look at the ones we already have and say, which ones do we like right now for new money? And It's become a very popular feature for both Motley Fool Stock Advisor and Motley Fool Rule Breakers, and I've been behind building those systems and having teams in place to pick those Best Buys now every month for low these many years for both of those services. But we thought, why not invite some of our members to play along with us. and Let's call them a league, and let's look for extraordinary stock pickers. And I'm really pleased to share with you a guest, a new friend that I'm making today, and I know you'll enjoy him too, because the top performer out of the 163 players in our league was Jean-Marc Ayas. And Jean-Marc is my interview this week. So you're going to get to hear from a fellow member of Motley Fool Rule Breakers, but somebody who has distinguished himself as the number one performer in the league. Briefly, here's how the game works. I'm sure I'll mention this a little bit more in my interview with him, but out of all those 100 plus Rule Breaker stock picks, active recommendations in the service, we invited Jean Marc and others to pick the five that they liked most that particular month, and we give them 10 chips to allocate across those five stocks. So, For example, they could just put two on each, or they could load up six on one and put four ones, one down on the four others. So, it's however you want to play 10 chips on those five stocks. And Admittedly, this was a somewhat short-term game, because we were just running it as a one-year contest, but the scores that each player racked up were based on multiplying their chips times the performance of each of the picks times specifically the outperformance of each of those picks and so Jean-Marc racked up over 5000 points over the last 12 months playing our game with us and yes he is an extraordinary stock picker so I'm going to introduce him in just a little bit but I want to mention the second half of this week's podcast is a review of one of our five stock samplers yep it was a year ago this month well actually a year ago two weeks ago. So It's been about 54 weeks later, but 54 weeks ago, I picked five great stocks you've never heard of. And What we'll discover together is how these stocks have done over the last year, and whether, in fact, they have been great, or whether their picker, i.e. me, was maybe not so great. We'll get to see how we're doing with those five stocks on the latter half of this week's podcast. Now, I should mention, we are taping ahead of the actual air date of this podcast. Normally, we tape on Tuesdays, and we release to you Wednesday afternoons, but this time, I'm at the Conscious Capitalism Summit, the CEO Summit in Austin, Texas, which I go to once a year this second week of October. It's always a delightful group of people and very inspirational. I hear about many different businesses and not-for-profits, too, all of whom are united by this concept of consciousness and capitalism well done. So That's where I am. Therefore, this is being taped last Thursday. So I hope the world won't have changed too much for the five stocks I'll be reviewing or what I talk about with Jean-Marc, but you should know that we pre-taped this one, especially early this particular week. And since I'm doing this intro after having already talked to Jean Marc Ayas, I just wanted to note one thing that I cover with him. Last week, I hope many of you will remember, we dedicated this podcast to getting started investing. And if you're not already an investor, I hope in the last seven days you've become one. I hope inspired by our conversation last week. But one of the interesting themes that ran through the four of us who participated in last week's podcast was, I think all four of us had been started by our parents, often a parent sitting us down and 
talking about the stock market on drives to school, making a regular conversation around the supper table. And in fact, you'll hear the Jean Marc, even though he's from a very different place, and in fact, another country had the exact same experience himself. So I can't help but point out that that's a key thread that runs not just through last week, but through this week. But of course, I hope that thread continues to spread itself out through our kids and our kids' kids, and making sure that whether you have kids or not, or whether you're a great uncle or aunt or grandparent, that you have that opportunity to get a younger person started investing. And look at the flowers that bloom from that. And we're hearing that almost every week, it seems, these days on this podcast. So, great to hear Jean-Marc and how he gets started. Well, without further ado, let's start my conversation with Jean-Marc Ayas. And now I want to welcome him, Jean-Marc Ayas. It's great to have you at Rule Breaker Investing. Thanks for having me, David. So I wanted to start with the question that I very frequently ask new employees who come to the Fool or friends of mine who say they invest. It's the obvious one, Jean-Marc. How did you begin investing? At what age? What was the circumstance? Um, so I believe I, w- I must have been 12 or 13 at the time, um, and it was my dad who uh, who introduced me to uh, to the stock market. He showed me uh, his investments, his personal portfolio, and um, at the time we had to also uh, we could only get quotes um, on the on, in the newspaper <laughs> the next morning, or <laughs> follow the ticker on the television, which was alphabetical, so you had to basically wait until the stock you were looking for would, would end up uh, coming on the ticker. So that, that's uh, basically how I, I got introduced to it. And um, I was able to follow his investments. I was able to follow the news flow on the companies that he was looking at and, and get a better understanding of the dynamic and, and what makes the markets go up and down. Um, it, was, it was interesting. Uh, and it's not until much later that I made my first personal investment, but mm. it was a, it was a great way to get introduced. And was your father a professional? Was this his calling? Was he an investor? Can you tell me a little bit about your family background? Um, my father is a professional, yes, but uh, not in finance. My father is an architect, um, mm. and uh, and uh, my family background is uh, my my parents basically were. were Immigrants to, to Quebec uh, from Egypt. They came in uh, the late 60s. Mm. They settled here and studied here, and uh, eventually uh, built their family here. Um, and I've lived in Montreal ever since. Uh, ever since then. So discerning listeners will pick up just a just a slight French accent, a lovely uh, French accent behind the excellent English that you speak, uh, Jean-Marc, on a professional daily basis. What, how do you spend your time these days? I work uh, currently. I work for uh, one of Canada's big five banks. I work in the equity research team, uh, covering um, Canadian retail stocks. Uh, because it's a thin market, um, we cover both staples and discretionary stocks. Mm-hmm. In the past, I, uh, I had some uh, some years in investment banking, also at a boutique firm here in Montreal that was eventually sold. And um, and currently, these are actually my last two weeks uh, in my current role because I'll be uh, I will be transitioning to a to a new career path um, and working for um, a company that I actually used to cover um, in in the role in which I'm I'm currently uh, uh-huh. implicated. Mm-hmm. This company is called uh, Alimentation Couchetar. It's uh, one of the world's largest uh, C store operators and acquirers. Um, in the U.S., you would probably more, be more familiar with it uh, through the Circle K brand. Ah, uh, yes. Um, yeah, and uh, and so they're looking to build an investor relations department, uh, potentially also uh, bring in some uh, some tr- strategic responsibilities. And uh, I'm going to be the first uh, person hired to to help build that team. That's very interesting. It occasions two different kinds of questions. The first is just going to be about alimentation. Gustav, as you mentioned, and I'm just interested that they don't already have an investor relations department. It's a big company. Yeah, it's it's pretty it's pretty impressive actually that they've grown to the size uh, where where they are currently, and and uh, never did it with an investor relations department <laughs> helping to guide um, helping to guide the uh, investors in the street. Um, yeah, they they've they've had in the past um, a way of functioning that was more ad hoc with investors. I think they're looking to organize it uh, more right now, mm-hmm. and um, it makes uh, it makes complete sense. This is a company that is very acquisitive. Uh, they're becoming bigger and bigger on the on a global scale, 
and uh, and expanding their investor base. And I think this can only be good for uh, for the messaging and and letting investors and analysts as well understand um, what are the key points of Kustar's story and and what they're able to accomplish. Mm. Well, I know a lot of Americans would recognize Circle K and uh, a long time brand, a convenience store um, brand here in the U.S. Uh, I'm curious, then, the second dynamic that I wanted to ask a question along from that uh, interesting bit of information from you, Jean-Marc, is just your own choice, your, your decision to shift your career from equity research to investor relations. So, I'm, I'm wondering, on the one hand, does, is equity research not paying that much anymore, or was this just an exciting <laughs> opportunity? What was the choice that you're making to change the path of your career? Oh, it's no, it's it's definitely the opportunity uh, that 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 Alimentation Kushtar offers. Um, it, like I said, it's a global company. It's a company that's known for uh, for offering opportunities uh, to their employees to to learn uh, all the different sectors of the company. So there's always going to be opportunities to move. Whether I end up staying ultimately in investor relations mm-hmm. uh, or move to uh, to other areas, potentially even in in operations, uh, maybe even in the U.S. Okay. <laughs> so, there's there's a lot more runway I think uh, compared to the bank, um, and um, and also uh, to be fair I, I I work in Montreal and uh, the finance industry in Montreal is is not the same as it is in Toronto and New York in terms of uh, vertical movement uh, uh. within corporations. So it's a decision that I I knew would eventually come. Uh, I was waiting for the right opportunity, and and uh, in two weeks I'll be uh, I'll be there. Well, they found a very good man for the job. In fact, they found an extraordinary Extraordinary stock picker. So, in the introduction earlier, I mentioned a little bit uh, the experiment that we went on together with you and 162 others in our Motley Fool Rule Breakers service, inviting some of our most engaged members to come in on a monthly basis and play the same game that we play internally as we select our best buys now for the service. So, just to rehash a little bit, uh, we asked Jean Marc and 162 others to submit five companies. Each month over the last 12 months, five companies that they favored to beat the market. And we asked you specifically if we gave you 10 chips and you had to put them on those five companies, which one would you put two on? Which one might you put four on or one on? So you allocated 10 chips across those five companies. And I'm really excited to be talking to the number one performer, Jean Marc Ayas, who outperformed everybody else, racked up over 5,000 points. Uh, that's just basically multiplying the chips and the outperformance that he achieved. And so, of course, the rest of this interview, Jean Marc, is us finding out how you got so good at this and what you've been doing. So, let me first start by asking when you were picking stocks from the Rule Breakers service, did you find yourself Picking from the industry that you professionally follow, or did you find yourself spreading it out? Um, no, most of the picks were, uh, were were spread out. In terms of the industry that I follow, I think maybe there was one name uh, that I recall, Five Below, mm-hmm. uh, which is a uh, which is the, which is a discretionary retailer that uh, sells items at five dollars and below, and that has <laughs> a lot of uh, growth in the U.S. and that right now is is, is seeing a tremendous performance. Mm-hmm. Um, but besides that one, um, most of uh, the picks that I made were in industries that I'm not as familiar with, but that have I've been learning uh, as, I, as I've been reading The Fool and, and, and covering uh, these companies. Wonderful. And so, let me, let's put a few more company names into play, companies that helped you toward outstanding performance over the last year. What are some of your favorite rule breakers, either ones you picked a year ago that helped you to this outperformance, or ones that you would just favor right now going forward? Yeah, my my favorite one by far was the trade desk, and it's funny because in the in the early stages of the game, I think I I must have been in the bottom ten percent of the performers for the first <laughs> six months of this uh, of this stock picking contest because the trade desk's performance had been awful, and <laughs> month after month, I kept adding it uh, to my picks and weighing it pretty heavily. Hmm. Um, but it's a company that I believed in. It's a company that, uh, for whatever reason, wasn't performing well as a stock, but continued to see very strong um, market potential. Um, and uh, and then uh, they reported a quarter, um, and the stock got rewarded uh, because the results were extremely strong. And then there was a second uh, quarterly report uh, that did just the same. I think in, in each case, the stock went up uh, on the next day, hmm. more than 30% or so. 
and so that not only uh, allowed me to uh, save face, but <laughs> it, it propelled <laughs> my score uh, fairly high. Mm. Yeah, that's a comedy that came to Rule Breakers in February of 2017, and so here we are a year and a half later, and from that initial buy at um, $34.30 to see it at about 136 today means that, yeah, it's gone up four times in value over that year and a half. But isn't it interesting to think that for the first several months as you were playing along, Jean-Marc, that it was such an underperformer and so disappointing, even within that incredible run over the last year and a half of it going up four times in value. Yeah, no, absolutely. You're you're right. It's it's very interesting and and even uh, even though the market reaction had had not been great after uh, after some of the earnings releases, the the earnings were were great. The uh, the revenues were growing quickly and and just listening to the conference calls um, and and to CEO Jeff Green and his team talk about their opportunities and the performance, it was hard to understand why the market wasn't rewarding uh, the company, and it was hard to understand how things could go wrong. <laughs> and uh, and uh, not just in the conference calls, but I've, I've had the chance to, uh, to, to listen to a bunch of uh, presentations that, uh, that Jeff Green has made uh, that mm-hmm. are posted online. Um, he's a very insightful uh, leader. He's, he's really on top of his business, on top of his industry, and he's got tremendous vision. Um, and so all of these things uh, made me appreciate uh, where the company was headed. And not to mention that when you look at the metrics, this was a company that had fast growth, that had uh, expanding margins. It was profitable com- uh, compared to, to many of its peers that weren't. Um, and it was a major disruptor of the, the, the current industry. Dynamic. That's right. So, and, and for uh, those a- who have not yet found the Trade Desk, I should just mention that they basically um, are behind programmatic ad buying. So, um, their goal is to put the right ad in front of the right shopper at the right time using the internet as a kind of a cloud based optimization platform for ad buyers. So, if they're doing their job well, Jean Marc, right, you as an advertiser are really pleased. To work with them because you're working with kind of a visionary team that knows how to use all of the different ways we can reach people to reach the right people. That's correct. That's correct. And and I would add to that that the that the uh, the demand platform that they've built is is the largest independent one. And I think in the long term this is going to be very important uh, for media buyers who uh, who are going to be choosing basically between the closed systems that are offered by Google or Facebook. So not to get too mm. technical, but I think it's a it's a big advantage that the company has and that the market potentially overlooked for a good chunk of time. So I don't want to dwell too long on the trade desk because there's so many other companies I'd love to talk about with you, and I know we're going to run out of time, and I'm not even going to get to talk about everything I'd like to talk about anyway. But let's <laughs> let's put a couple more company names into play. What are a couple more companies that you particularly have favored or did well with over the last 12 months? So some some of the companies that I weighed more heavily, um, I'm not sure it did as well um, in the grand scheme of things. But it's a company that I did weigh heavily and that I, I believe in very much is Take Two uh, Interactive. Mm. Um, it's a company that's benefiting uh, a lot from strong trends in the gaming industry, uh, with mobile and esports doing extremely well and growing fast. Um, they have. They have some strong uh, game franchises, and, and I know you're a, you're a gaming fan, so <laughs> I so can't wait for Red Dead Redemption. Do, but... <laughs> yep, Red Dead Redemption Two is coming out in just a few weeks. Right. So <laughs> their strong franchises uh, are very good for the stickiness of the revenues, and uh, they keep putting the money back in uh, to to develop new games and new franchises that are ben- that are going to eventually benefit in the future. Mm. But I think most of all for that one, what I, what I appreciated was was its size. Um, it's maybe not always the best way to, to evaluate, but when you look at Activision Blizzard and EA Sports and how big they are, uh, it, it shows the potential that Take Two has to, to to get to these levels, and I think that's what was interesting to me. That's right. So Take Two's market cap these days looks like it's clocking in around fifteen billion dollars, whereas Electronic Arts is more than twice that size, as is Activision Blizzard. So, I mean, what a tremendous industry it's been. They're all winners, right? And and I think that it remains such an important industry going forward. Correct. How about another company? I also weighed heavily on uh, iRobot. 
And uh, this one uh, is a company that I've always liked. Um, I find they're very innovative. Um, I don't personally own any of the products, but I know people who do. I've mm-hmm. seen them operate. Uh, it's a fun company with with fun products and, and a lot of uh, new uses that could eventually come. Um, and um, in this case, I think it was more a, a question of uh, the stock had been beaten down uh, after some misses, um, but also because of some fears of competition coming from uh, from uh, Chinese brands. Um, but when you would listen to the CEO talking about his business, and mm-hmm. he's always been pretty frank about it, um, the, 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 the discussion has always been the same, which is uh, the market opportunity is, is very large. There could be other players that come in, and it's not necessarily going to stop us from, from getting uh, the growth that we, that we need. Mm-hmm. And we have the opportunity to get into new product uh, areas. So this, this was a company that I opportunistically, I guess, added to, uh, to my stock picks based on, on the weakness, and it eventually rebounded, and, and that helped uh, my performance. And one more curiosity question. This is more about your strategy playing the game that we gave you to play. When you're given 10 chips, were you typically going 2-2-2-2-2 two, 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 two across five companies, or did you go with some 6 one, 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 ones? Or how, how did you play the game? I don't think I ever did a six one one one, but I, I definitely put uh, some different weights on most months. Um, there were months where I didn't have any particular inclination, and so I, I kept it at uh, twos evenly across the board. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I believe I've put some four weights a few times on on some of the companies, depending on where the current uh, stock uh, price was uh, when when I had to make the pick, and depending on. Uh, the, the potential that that I could see in the, in the next uh, few months. It's particularly interesting in a game like this because, obviously, in the long term, um, when you're investing for the long term, the dynamic is going to be much different than when you're investing for one year. And, mm-hmm. then, yep. and so you have to you have to respect the fact that there's going to be earnings releases. There there's different things that you have to take <laughs> in consideration in terms of timing. And uh, there's also the fact that momentum played a part. I mean, it was obvious that there was a lot of momentum in uh, in uh, uh, software as a service stocks, and so I focused a lot of my uh, a lot of my uh, chips on mm-hmm. on companies like those. So this was a one year experiment for us. It's the first time we'd tried the league, and and for now we're just pausing it and just reflecting on the results. And Jean Marc, I know we're going to invite you to come into our farm team and our team on Motley Fool Rule Breakers and be part of our regular voting. You've certainly distinguished yourself, and we would love to do that with you. But um, I'm wondering, just any advice that you would have for investors in general, based on your perspective as a very successful, obviously you're a professional at this, but as a very successful investor, yes, it was just a year, and you and I know that anything can happen in a year, but clearly your instincts, uh, backed up by your professional experience, suggest that you're probably going to do well, not just last year, but in the next five years, too. So, how, how do you suggest somebody approach these kinds of more volatile companies and these innovators? Well, I, I have to I have to say that my early years investing were horrible. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I didn't do well because I was I was mostly buying stocks and not buying companies, which is something that the fool uh, has has taught me to to do better. Mm-hmm. Um, over the years, I've followed a lot of the advice that uh, that have been uh, that have been dispensed on on your site mm-hmm. and on in your podcasts. And uh, so, I would say my biggest takeaway is. Um, is to invest for the very long term and to hopefully not sell, never sell. Um, so this is something that I learned and that has that has been good for my portfolio for a while now. When I when I look back at some of the investments that I did have, um, it's it's interesting because uh, I used to own Amazon in 1999. I I purchased it. And mm. probably sold it shortly thereafter, and then I bought it again in 2002 and sold it <laughs> shortly <laughs> thereafter. And I thought I was smart with 30% returns, but um, I think the key for me now uh, has been to to buy uh, to buy stocks and to hold on to them for for a very long time, especially when it's companies um, that are rule breakers that are disrupting markets. It takes time for for these trends to play out, and uh, it's it's important to follow through uh, with these companies for the long term to see how they end up. Spectacular. 
All right. Well, now as we come to a close, the two questions I often like to ask around Full HQ to people I've just met for the first time. Let's say a new employee. Here they come. The first one, Jean Marquez. What's your superhero power? Um, I would say I'm I'm resilient. Um, it's hard to put me down. Um, I'm. Uh, I'm the type of person that's not afraid to fail, and so I always look at these situations as learning opportunities for the future. That's wonderful. And sometimes there's overlap with that first answer with the second question that I'm going to ask. But I I know you've heard this podcast before, so you may have heard me ask this of my fellow employees. At The Motley Fool, we have our core values, and one of them is your motley. And the idea is that we are blended together from hundreds of different people who come from different walks of life, and they all come to work here at Full headquarters, and each of them has a value that probably defines them that that they stand for. And so, the catchphrase we use around these halls is "What's your motley?" And so, my question for you, Jean Marc, I ask is, "What's your motley?" Um, mine would be uh, the word kaizen comes to mind. So that's Japanese uh, for continuous improvement, mm. um, and uh, that's something that I that I always it's an approach that I always take, which is to always get better at everything that I undertake, and everything that I take interest in in general. And does that come from was that Toyota's manufacturing process, or do, do you know the background of kaizen? For some reason, I associate it with uh, General Electric, but I'm uh, I'm not sure why that is. Uh, <laughs> I think maybe because it was mentioned uh, by Jack Welch several times in, in his uh, in his books um, and in his management uh, style. But uh-huh. um, I, to be honest, I'm not sure. Well, actually, through our friend Wikipedia, which I'm looking at as we speak, I see that it's a little bit of both. So it it, it was once called the Toyota Way, and it was. Um, first practice in Japanese businesses after World War II, influenced by American business, but indeed General Electric and others, big um, practitioners and and in some cases originators. So that's really an interesting blend and a great motley. So well, Jean Marc Ayas, I want to thank you so much for having graced us as the number one performer in the League of Extraordinary Stock Pickers, graced us with your performance over the last year and your presence in this week's podcast. So I hope you have a wonderful transition into that next phase of life, and I look forward to talking in future. Thank you, David. It's been a, it's been a great conversation, and I'm, I'm glad I had the opportunity to speak with you. Wow, you know, I'd never actually talked to Jean Marc before, but how much fun was it to just pick up the phone and find out who is this person who won our stock contest? I had never talked to him before. That conversation I just shared with you, and that was a lot of fun. I do want to mention again getting started investing since we're going to be the first week of November, closing out that series with part two a few weeks hence. I just want to remind you that you can email us, rbi at fool.com, if you have additional questions about getting started investing, or a great story of how you've just gotten started investing, or somebody else as a result of last week's podcast. But again, the first week of November, we're going to be dedicating to answering any questions that were aroused by last week's podcast, or any additional stories or pointers that we can add when we close it out in the first week of November. All right, well, it's time to review five great stocks you've never heard of. The date was September 13th, 2017. The Rule Breaker Investing Podcast that published that Wednesday, slightly more than a year ago, was entitled Five Great Stocks You've Never Heard Of. And here's how I came up with that list. Well, I remember remarking on that podcast that I had recently submitted 10 different possible stock recommendations to my friend Simon Erickson, who helps run Motley Fool Explorer. And Motley Fool Explorer, some of you will know and be subscribers to, but if you're not a member, this is a service where monthly, we come up with four stocks in kind of like March Madness, a Final Four bracket that you'd be used to if you're a college basketball fan. We battle them against each other to see which is the one that will be the winner that month. And we'll pick a theme, like maybe we'll say AI or marijuana stocks, or whatever it is that seems interesting at the time, and we'll find four companies that are tied into that theme in some way. And then, our talented group of stock pickers, some more extraordinary stock pickers at The Motley Fool, end up winning those four down to the final one, and then we put real money into that one stock. And so, Simon Erickson, who oversees that service, came to me and said, Hey, David, let's do one with lesser-known companies. And he said, Could you submit me 10 ideas? And I gave him my 10 ideas, and he used four of them. And history will show he took Insulate, Massimo, 
Pegasystems and 2U. I don't have time to talk through those companies today. I hope some of you would recognize Insulet, Massimo, Pegasystems, or 2U. But those were the four that Simon took. And I'll mention at the end how the one that one has done in the intervening year. But the six that he did not pick from, I felt like, well, I'd done the work. So why wouldn't I? Take five great stocks that you've never heard of from those six and feature them as my stock sampler on this podcast. And that's exactly what I did. Now, there were five traits that needed to be true of these companies, and they are, in fact, true of all of them. Trait number one, they needed to never have been picked by any of our Supernova missions. So, Supernova, another service I'm affiliated with at The Motley Fool, has real money portfolios. They're drawn from my picks in Stock Advisor and Rule Breakers. And yet, of the 210 companies that were in the Supernova universe a year ago, 130 of them had never been previously selected in any real money portfolio. So, I figured that's trait number one. I want to pick something that hasn't yet gotten additional love here at The Motley Fool. Trait number two, it had to have a market cap of under $10 billion. Because probably, if it's a great stock you've never heard of, it's not going to have a market cap that's really big. And now that I can say market cap and know that all of my listeners know what that is every week without having Having to explain it because we have a game show that we play on a quarterly basis. You understand that when we go for smaller companies with market caps below $10 billion, we're looking in more the hidden gems of this kind of a universe. Trait number three, the brand name must be one you and I wouldn't recognize. So earlier when I said that Simon took Insulet, Massimo, Pega Systems, and 2U, I'm thinking most of the people. Well, maybe not listeners of this podcast, but anybody that you might talk to on the street probably haven't heard of Insulet or Pegasystems. Am I right? So that needed to be true of these five stocks I'm going to share with you as well. Trait number four, they had to have already been long term market beaters. That's right. Usually, in my experience, the winners keep on winning. One of my ultra themes, one of my uber themes of this podcast. And so I wanted to find companies that had already done well, thinking they're going to continue to do well. And then finally, number five, the fifth trait, I told Simon, I'm going to select for you. And the list I give you, these are companies that I really I admire in some way, shape, or form. There's some special affinity I have with them. Usually, it's just I like what they do in this world. So those are the stocks. Simon took his four from the ten. He left me with six, and I took five of those six, and I made him five great stocks you'd never heard of. And I said, this is odd for me. I said, let's do them in reverse alphabetical order that particular podcast. So I'm going to now present the results in that same order, reverse alphabetical order. So, longtime listeners of this podcast know that we're always trying to beat the stock market averages with our five stock samplers. And you'll also know, if you're a longtime listener, that we've had a great deal of success with these. Out of the roughly 15 of these we've done over three plus years, we barely ever lost with any of them. So, always when I bring back a review, the big question is, can we keep the music going? Well, let's see. All right, stock number one. Remember, reverse alphabetical order. The ticker symbol is ULTI. The company is Ultimate Software. This is a company that sort of does talented human resource management using the cloud, cloud services through its UltiPro platform. This is a company with recurring revenue, one I like a lot. And I'm happy to say I like it even more because of its performance low these last 12 months. So, spoiler alert, this is the best performer in the group. ULTI, it was at 187. At market close on September 13th, a year ago, and today it's at 311. So, quick math, it's up 66%. Now, we're always comparing ourselves to the S&P 500, to the market's average. How has the market done over the last year? Well, the market is up 16% since that podcast on September 13th. So, plus 66 for ULTI for Ultimate Software. Minus 16 from the market gives us a plus 50. We're beating the market by 50 percentage points to start off this five stock sampler. Now, stock number two, I'm happy to say it's going to help out as well. And this was probably of the five companies the most interesting one and the best story that I have for you because five days after this podcast aired a year ago, this company got bought out. Shocker. Just five days after our podcast, I didn't even get a chance to do my next podcast before this company had already been bought out, or at least announced to have been bought out. The company, the ticker symbol is OA. The company was Orbital ATK. This is an aerospace and defense company. 
Orbital ATK operating not far from Fool headquarters here in, in Northern Virginia, a longtime rule breaker holding and a market beater for us. At the time that I did the podcast, it closed that day at 108. And five days later, Northrop Grumman said, We're going to pay all cash. $134.5 a share for that company. And so, yep, Orbital ATK has been a winner for us. Now, there is some question how to score this, because right away the stock went up to about 130 or so. And probably in real life, you might have considered closing it out at that point. But I'll just point out that it wasn't until June of this year that the final deal was consummated. Yes, it was at $134.5 from Northrop Gumman, but we'll go ahead and score it that way. So the stock went from 108 to 134.5 this past June. That's up 25 percentage points. And the market over that period of time from last year's podcast to June, when this one disappeared, was up 11%. So, we're going to give ourselves a plus 14 in the win column for stock number two. 50 plus 14 is plus 64. We're off to a hellaciously good start with five great stocks you've never heard of. Stock number three, well, I'm happy to say this is a contributor to positive score as well. Stock number three is Nuvasive. The ticker symbol is NUVA. Nuvasive, the company behind spinal surgery, minimally invasive solution of its own kind, coming in through the side of your body if you're going to have spinal surgery. It's an innovative procedure, and I'm happy to say Nuvasive has been a winner over the last year. So the stock, right after the podcast, was at $58.5 a share. Today it is at $69. So we're talking about a stock that is up 18 percentage points. Again, the market up 16 percentage points. So just a minor outperformance, but outperformance nonetheless. So that's a plus two. That puts us plus 66 in the win column after three of our five stocks. Now, here's some bad news. The rest are losers. So the question is, are we going to stay above water after I go through stocks number four and five? And before I present stocks number four and five again in reverse alphabetical order, I should mention that typically when you pick five stocks, you're going to have probably a few losers. It's very rare that we're going to get five stocks out of five beating the market. But I'm happy to say often it's one great stock or one or two that has consistently propelled us to outstanding performance, not just in these five stock samplers, but you know, it's often a smaller minority of stocks in Motley Fool Stock Advisor or Motley Fool Rule Breakers that provide tremendous amounts of outperformance. And in fact, a single big winner, in my experience, wipes out all of your losers combined and then leaves some profit on top of that. A company like Netflix or a company like Intuitive Surgical in Stock Advisor and Rule Breakers, respectively. These are tremendous long-term winners. Of course, the only way you're ever going to get great performance is by holding over long periods of time. You heard Jean-Marc Ayas, my new friend, double underline that earlier in my conversation with him. So, so I guess I'm not surprised that I have a couple losers. I'm always disappointed, but let's see how much they lost. Stock number four. And of these five companies, this is probably the least well known of all. Little Fuse. Little, not even spelled like small, but L I T T E L, maybe a German name. Little Fuse. Yep, it's kind of a fuse company. It makes circuit protection products. It makes, it's one of those companies that has just thousands of different products, lots of little gizmos, lots of little different fuses and ways to protect surges in your house if there's a lightning storm. This is a certainly a company that does sell, in some cases, to consumers, but a lot of them B2B industrial sales, business to business. So, that's Little Fuse. I'm sorry to say, Little Fuse has underperformed since I picked it a year ago on this podcast. It was at $185 a share then. Today, it's at 193 So, it's up four percentage points. It's not down, but with the market up 16 percentage points, that has been an underperformer. So, we have to deduct 12 points from our plus 66 score. That gets us down to plus 54 as we hit our fifth and final stock, also an underperformer. Which brings us to our fifth and final stock, as I already mentioned, also an underperformer. The real question is just how badly? Well, let's see. The ticker symbol of stock number five is BLKB. The company name is Blackbaud. And Blackbaud is a cloud based platform and services company serving a lot of the not for profits that you know and love in this world. That's right. If you have a friend who runs a not for profit or works at one, or maybe that friend is you, maybe you do it, you may well know Blackbaud as a company that for a few decades now has been enabling you to manage and oversee your business, the donations you're taking in, and to help manage 
uh, not for profit, and it is a leader within its industry. Unfortunately, it wasn't a leader versus the stock market. A year ago, Black Baud was at $84 a share when I picked it on this podcast. These days, it's at 96. So I will say that it is up, and that does make me happy. It did underperform. It's up 14%, the market up 16%. So it's only a minus two that we take away from our 54 percentage points of that performance for 52 percentage points overall as we now wrap up the numbers for this five stock sampler review. That's right. These five stocks picked a year ago, the market was up 16% on average. These companies are up 26%. And so that's not bad for a group of companies that you've never heard of and they were picked out of the scraps of unclaimed picks by my friend Simon Erickson, as he continues to do the good work he does in Motley Fool Explorer. Now, I did mention earlier that he took those other four, and from those four, Massimo was the one that our team in Motley Fool Explorer selected and put real money in. So, you might be wondering, well, my stocks that I've just shared with you are up 26% on average, the market was up 16 How did Massimo do in Motley Fool Explorer, picked at the same time? Well, Massimo was at $84.35 when the Motley Fool put its own real money into it. It was the theme that month was called Hidden in Plain Sight, which is kind of the same idea of great stocks you've never heard of. And Massimo today has gone from 84 to 119. It's up 45%. So I want to congratulate Simon Erickson and the Motley Fool Explorer team for their outstanding outperformance, which Motley Fool Explorer has generated months and months and years now, but it's fun to notice, in closing, that their stock actually outperformed my basket of five stocks, and yet I was still pretty happy with our basket of five stocks. Well, enough. What a fun time it was getting to meet a new fool, Jean-Marc Ayas. Thank you for joining me. And to review these five stocks picked a year ago on this podcast and see how they've done. Five great stocks you've never heard of. Next week, I'm going to celebrate a special moment in Motley Fool Stock Advisor history. My brother Tom and I have picked one stock every month since March of 2002. And if you do the math with me, and darn it, why would you? You would know that this month's pick represents pick number 200, the 200th monthly pick that my brother Tom and I have made in support of Motley Fool Stock Advisor members going back to March of 2002. So next week's podcast is going to be called 200 Stock Advisor Picks Later. In the meantime, Fool on.